Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Sumun Lee from International Christian University. Welcome to this practical workshop for OT Workplace, organized by Haro Kobozono at Ninjal uh, and me. And uh, today's workshop is sponsored by ICU Link Lab, uh, Ninjal Collaborative Research Project, Cross Linguistic Studies of Japanese Prosody and Grammar, the Phonological Society of Japan, and the Phonetic Society of Japan. Um, we received a lot of help from the assistants, uh, Michinori Suzuki and Paris Fleming from ICU, as well as Richard Phipps and Nick Van Handel from UCSC. Today's workshop, uh, especially the first hour, will be led by uh, Jenny Bellick, who is a postdoctoral researcher of linguistics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she received her PhD in 2019. Her research interests are in optimality theory, the syntax prosody interface, articulatory phonology, phonology, among others. Yes, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, start the lecture. The floor is yours, Jenny. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so today we'll be doing the OT work tutorial. Um, OT Workplace is a very feature rich tool for doing optimality theory analyses. Um, to quote from the website, they say OT Workplace provides an environment for interactive research in OT built on Excel. So we'll be, we'll be in Excel. It implements the analytical tools of modern rigorous optimality theory, um, and it has many, many features. We're going to just see some uh, basic use cases. So the, the website is here. Um, the authors of OT Workplace are Alan Prince, uh, Naz Merchant, and Bruce Tessar, with additions by Luca Jacoponi and Natalie Del Busto, and it's maintained by Alan Prince and Naz Merchant. Um, and Naz Merchant is the person to contact for uh, maintaining your access or any kind of troubleshooting problems with the, the remote server access to OT Workplace. So for example, if you're uh, on a, a Mac computer like me, then uh, you need um, either a virtual machine or, to, or uh, this remote server to use OT Workplace since it requires the Microsoft version of Excel. Um, and there's going to be a question about that in the post-workshop survey if you want to keep your uh, remote desktop uh, OT Workplace account. All right, so to uh, hey, just... Jenny, uh, can you yeah. make it a little bit wider? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, let's see. It's yeah. Gonna... If it's possible, yeah. Yeah, just a second. Uh, let's... How's that? I hope that's... Maybe. Okay. Yeah, 150 might be better. Yeah, yeah we can. If I'm going to have to have it smaller later when we do the OT workplace, but this is, we can make it really big for now. Okay, right. there we go. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, right. So uh, as a reminder, we're looking at uh, OT systems. So a system consists of the, the candidate set, and we want to formally define that as well as the constraint set. So yesterday we saw examples of how to set up a system in spot. And today we're going to go over three options for setting up a system in OT workplace to continue with the analysis. So the, the first option is you set it up in spot uh, like we did yesterday and then import the violation tableau from spot into OT workplace. So I'll demonstrate that using the system that we built yesterday, um, MSP ASP. The second option is to use a built-in system uh, that's in OT Workplace, and I'll demonstrate that with this uh, elementary syllable theory system, EST. And then the third option is to actually define the system directly in OT Workplace. Uh, so then in that case, you have to develop your own representation for the candidates, write your own candidate set, uh, and you do your constraint definitions, um, although there's some built-in ones as well. And uh, depending on time, I will demonstrate that with uh, example of voicing assimilation based on the uh, Lombardi 1999. All right, so for each system, I'm going to show how to set up the project in OT Workplace, uh, calculate the factorial typology, and then uh, filter the typology to look for a particular language, and then get ranking information about languages in the typology. All right. So demo one is going to be bringing a spot analysis into OT Workplace. So let's start by getting the violation tableau from spot. Um, so we need to go to the spot uh, app interface. The link is right there. And for this one, we're going to use a, a built-in system. So we're going to, uh, let me make this bigger too. Okay, so here's the spot interface. And 
yesterday we didn't do anything with the built-in systems, but today let's use the built-in system. So at the top here, there's the section. And when you click on the menu, um, you can see this, this drop-down menu and we wanna get this one. Uh, it says Japanese with a check, meaning that this is one of the systems that captures the Japanese phrasing pattern with a asymmetrical uh, treatment of uniformly left branching versus right branching uh, forward phrases. And we want this one that says match SP align SP because that's the MSP ASP that we built yesterday. So if you click on it, then it's going to fill in um, all these trees that were in the candidate set that we defined, um, these gen settings that we did yesterday, and the map line and binarity constraints. OK, so uh, now hopefully everybody managed that. Um, and now if I click the Get Results button, I can download the, the CSV. And then, of course, the Tableau are also displayed in, in the interface as well. OK, so. Um, I want to open this file so uh, we can see it in the folder or depending on your setup. So I'm on the remote desktop right now, and this is this is how the Chrome on the remote desktop behaves. So you can either open the folder and get it there or um, open it uh, directly, and it should open in Excel. For some reason, it made this tiny window. There we go. So it's like this. Let me make it bigger again. Right, so this is the this is the Excel display of the spot system that we set up yesterday, and right now it's just a comma separated value file CSV, um, and I want to go ahead and save it now as a um, actual Excel file so that when all the work that we do in OT Workplace will be um, saved in a proper format instead of just being a CSV uh, where it will erased. So I'm going to do the save as and uh, stick it in here. Um, and I'm going to call it a uh, spot. Um, and then the important thing is to change the, the type right, to Excel workbook. Um, OK, let me change the windows so we can see the, hand, uh, the handout and the OT workplace at the same time. Uh, While you are changing that, uh, let me ask uh, people a question. Anybody who has question up to this point, uh, or you're able to get to uh, this particular part uh, of using the website? Yeah. This was using a built-in system uh, on the website uh, that you can just download without doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. So the again, the built-in system is this guy up here at the top. Um, okay. So if there's no questions, I'll keep going. Anybody? Okay. So, um, oh yes, I should say. So, if you've done this in the remote desktop already, then you can just easily open it. Or if you have a local copy of uh, OT Workplace. Um, but if, okay, actually, I need to change the zoom. Sorry. Um, if you, um, if you did the got the built-in system in your on your local machine and then you need to transfer the file over to the remote desktop, uh, usually you can do that with a copy doing a copy uh, operation on your local machine and then paste on the remote desktop. Um, or if that doesn't work, you can like upload to Google Drive and download it, something like that, um, or redo it on the remote desktop. Okay, so then once once it's on the remote desktop um, or in a place where you have OT Workplace installed, you can just open the CSV file and um, you should see something like this. All right, so at this point, we can start to set up the um, set up the OT Workplace project. 
So we'll need to use the OT workplace menu, which uh, by default, you can't see that in Excel. So we need to use this add-ins tab up at the top. Um, and that's gonna, if I can move the Zoom menu, there we go. Then uh, the you can see the OT workplace menu here. And the first thing we need to do is tell it that we're starting a project. So this project start button. And since it's a new, it's a new one, uh, we're gonna say use choose this uh, top option, new name and header if needed, and I'm gonna call it spot. Although normally you might want a more informative name. Okay, so you can see once you set up the new project, then we end up with two tabs in this in this file. So the first one is this violation tableau that we were already on, and it's called spot.bt. And then to the left, you can see this uh, just blank yellow sheet that OT Workplace puts in. And that's just a divider for in case you accumulate uh, a bunch of projects in the same workbook, you have these uh, project um, tabs to help keep things organized. All right, so we know the whole violation tableau is already set up because that's what Spot gave us. So now we can uh, move on to calculating the factorial typology. That's um, step four in the in the handout over here. So again, go in the OT workplace menu. And then under factorial typology, you can click on fact type calculate. Right, and the those little, this information over here is telling you there's a keyboard shortcut. You can use control, I think control shift F to calculate the factorial typology, or you can use the menu. Um, and then this information over here is saying you need to do this command from a violation tableau page, VT standing for violation tableau. All right, so when I click that, uh, there's a bunch of boxes, dialog boxes that pop up. Um, so the first one is always this, this at least I, always seems to come up for me. Uh, this warning that you have uh, some some candidate sets, C sets that only have one candidate. Uh, do you wish to proceed? And you just say yes. Okay, and then you get this report of um, the harmonic bounding. HB stands for harmonically bound harmonic bounding, um, and it's telling us that there is 907 harmonically bounded candidates. And I'll go over what that means in a in a moment. Um, and it tells us some other information. So I'm going to say okay. We'll just keep going. And then we get this, what, they, what it calls itself an action report saying the total number of languages is 14 for this system. And there were 113 combinations of Optima that got tested against all these various combinations. Okay, so I'm just gonna say, okay, again. And now it asks if we want to issue ranking information on all 14 of the languages. Um, it's pretty slow if you, if you do that. So in this case, I'm gonna say no, and then we'll, pick which languages we want ranking information for later. All right, any any questions up to this point? I'm hoping that means we're okay. So we'll we'll go through this process for each of the systems. So um, if if you miss a step uh, in this demo, you can see it in the next one too. All right, so here's our factorial typology. Um, Oh, and let me go through what are all the, the tabs that are here now. So let me expand the OT workplace menu. So in the in the handout, it explains uh, what they all are, but I'm going to show them uh, in here as well. So earlier we just had, originally we just had this uh, violation tableau tab and this uh, yellow one. And then now that we calculated the factorial typology, we got this one, spot uh, dot uh, hash. This is just the same as the violation tableau, as far as I can tell, with uh, some prettier formatting. And then this one is, again, the violation tableau with a, yet another formatting. So here, the um, this H, here it has this HB suffix uh, standing for harmonic bounding. So this is the page that shows us um, which candidates are harmonically bounded. And the harmonically bounded ones are shown in pink. And what it means for a candidate to be harmonically bounded is that no matter how you order the constraints, that candidate is never going to be optimal. It's always going to lose. Um, in the case of this first candidate set, these are all the possible parses for our gen of the this, this three word input, A, B, C. And it turns out that only one of them, this green one, that's the only possible optimum with this constraint set. 
um, it harmonically bounds all the other ones. And if we look at the violation profile, we can see why. So it doesn't violate match at all. It doesn't violate a line left at all. It doesn't violate a line right. It doesn't violate bin min. It doesn't violate bin max branches. And it just has one violation of bin max leaves. And all of the other all of the other candidates also have one violation of bin max leaves. So this is just the best um, candidate for this input. And it's always going to be all of these other ones. And we can see we're going to see that in the factorial typology. In fact, let's take a look now if I magnify it a little bit more. Um, right, it's this first input. And you can see all the languages always have that same optimum. Um, that's the only parse that ever comes out for this input. So um, this harmonic bounding page is kind of explains um, why certain structures do or don't show up at all in the in the typology. You can see, oh, it, if it's pink, that's because it was harmonically bounded. And then you can compare it to, OK, which which of the green rows, the possible optima um, is is just better than it. Um, and there's two, I'm not sure if there's actually any collective bounding in this one. So there's two colors, there's two kinds of harmonic bounding. One is when there's a single candidate that's just better on all rankings. And the other is when, when you take a combination of optima, those collectively are always better. Um, and I think these are all simply harmonically bounded. They're all uh, pink, uh, yeah, okay. Well, in some other systems, you can end up with like magenta, some magenta ones, and that that indicates uh, collectively harmonically bounded candidates. All right, so if you ever are doing a, a study where you find, you look in your typology and there was some structure that you were expecting to be optimal and it never shows up, um, I, then you can go look in this harmonic bounding um, page and figure out, oh, let's see, why, why is that one harmonically bounded? Like, what, why, why was it not as good as I thought? All right, so then a more concise uh, picture of the violation tableau just takes out all the harmonically bounded candidates that are never gonna win and brings us down to this much smaller a violation tableau that only shows the optima, and that's this is the spot.opt tab. All right, so we started with the whole violation tableau that was pretty hard to read. This one's slightly prettier. This one highlights uh, in, in different color coding, uh, depending on whether things are harmonically bounded or possible optima, and then here's the concise version that's just the possible optima. Um, I think this is the one that uh, OT Workplace does its calculations on to actually come up with the factorial typology. All right, let's try to get back to this handout too. Um, okay, so how to read the factorial typology. Um, each row is a language, right? So language one, hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, up to fourteen in this case, um, and then each column is a um, an input. So, for this system, we had seven inputs. Here's the two uh, three-word inputs, and then the four-word inputs. And I think you can you can type some things in here. Sometimes they will disappear later. Uh, but this this one here in column seven is the one that we called 4WR. It's the uniformly right branching input with four terminals. And then these guys are the mixed ones, uh, 4WM mixed branching, right? So it branches uh, first to the right and then to the left inside this part. And then over here in column 15 is the uniformly left branching input. Okay, so um, let's say we're we're studying um, this Japanese phrasing pattern where the uniformly left branching input gets rebracketed into the symmetric branching pattern, and the uniformly right branching one uh, doesn't. Uh, in fact, everything else is isomorphically parsed. It's pretty hard to just look at the sea of parentheses and see what's going on. So it's helpful to filter the typology. So if you click on the little downward pointing triangle next to, um, next to an input, then Excel will show you 
all the shapes of parses that occur in that column. Um, so if you click on the, the little check mark next to select all, you can unselect all of them. And then what I'm gonna do is just select the last one, which is the parse that we're actually looking for, for this input. Um, I'm sorry, it's probably very small. Excel doesn't magnify the this little menu, uh, but this is the isomorphic parse. So it's that we had a uniformly right branching syntax, and then this is the uniformly right branching um, prosody. So when I select just that one and then click OK, uh, Excel hides all the rows that have a different value in this column. So now we go down to just seeing languages 11 through 14. So we know the like Japanese phrasing pattern is one of these four languages. And so then we can apply the same procedure to filter uh, other columns. Um, this is all spelled out in the, in the, in the handout as well. Um, so for the mixed branching one, again, we're looking for an isomorphic parse. And that's this one where we have every uh, square bracket, every XP in the syntactic input is translated into a, a round bracket, a phonological phrase in the output. So I'm gonna say, okay. And that brings us down to just two languages. Um, and then we can do one more filtering operation on the uniformly left branching input to check, figure out which language has the um, balanced branching. Or you could just look at it and see, but let's use the filter. Okay, so this this uh, bottom one is the uniformly the sorry the symmetric branching parse that we are looking for, and so I'm gonna pick that one and say okay. And now, um, now we've filtered down to only looking at language 12 in this typology, and that's the one that gives us this Japanese phrasing pattern where um, everything except for the uniformly left branching uh, syntax gets an isomorphic parse, but then this uniformly left branching input gets um, gets this balanced branching. So maybe since this language is interesting to us, we might want to highlight it. And you can do all the things um, in OT Workplace that you would normally do in Excel, like formatting things. So I'm going to uh, mark this as the, the good language um, just to make it stand out. And then we can take the, we can actually take the filters back off to see the other languages. So if you click on the ones that um, that you've filtered have this, instead of having just a plain triangle, they have this other little symbol. So you can click on that and then uh, say clear filter to uh, take the filter off and see the other languages again. So I'm gonna clear all of these filters and then we can see all 14 languages. All right, let me try and get the handout back on my screen. Um, and scroll down. Okay, so that was uh, that was the demonstration of filtering to find the Japanese pattern. And now, um, now let's think about uh, let's see how to get ranking information. Unless there's any any questions, you can also feel free to just interrupt with a question. Okay, so let's say we now we want to know. Okay, what is the what is the constraint ranking that gives us this pattern that we were interested in? We can put the cursor in the cell for language 12 and then go in the OT workplace menu. So again, we need to click on add-ins and then we can get this OT workplace menu. And then um, in the ranking section, we can pick one language ranking information and it will give us the ranking information for the, the language that the cursor is in, right? So that's language 12. And this sometimes takes a little while because OT Workplace is doing a bunch of math uh, behind the scenes. All right, so then we can just click OK, and this is the this is the ranking information for um, language twelve. Um, I'm not sure how big I can make it and still fit things. Um, hopefully that's legible. So there's a lot of information on this page. The most familiar thing probably is the Hasa diagram. So we can see from this diagram that this pattern is, we get this, the pattern we we're looking for when we have a line left and bin min branches and bin max branches all ranked over bin max leaves. And then bin max leaves is ranked over match SP for a line right. All right, so we care a lot about preserving left boundaries 
uh, but we don't care uh, at all about preserving right, well, we, we hardly care about preserving right boundaries in this, in this language. Um, so what about all these other things that are on this page? Um, so the, the top table is, is um, that's labeled SKB, that is the skeletal basis. Um, and it goes along with the one that's down here, MIB, which is the most informative basis. Um, and these are very reduced versions of the ranking information. Um, if you want to read more about them, I put a link in the, in the handout to some more details about that. Um, normally, I look at this guy here, the support. Um, this is the this this tells you uh, the inputs that you need to look at, and then the the winner loser pairs um, that provide all the evidence for all the crucial rankings in the language. So, let's look at one of those. Um, so this is a comparative tableau. Um, not everybody working in OT is familiar with them, but. They do show up a lot. Um, so the the W. So the instead of having uh, just one input um, in the upper left corner and then all of the outputs, there's several different inputs. So we've got a column for inputs, um, and then each row is comparing one winner against one loser um, candidate. So here in the first row, the input is the uniformly right branching input for WR. And we want, in this language, we are getting the isomorphic parts of that as the winner. Maybe I can make this a little bigger. Um, and that beats this loser, the symmetrically branching one. So that was another possible optima that loses in this language. And the fact that this uh, isomorphic one wins shows us that a line left, which favors the winner, that's what the W means, has to be ranked over uh, bin max leaves that favors the loser. So the L means um, this constraint favors the loser in this row. The W means uh, that constraint favors the winner in that row. Um, so either a line left or uh, this other W, match SP, has to be ranked over bin max leaves to get uh, this one winning over this one. Um, if we look at the bottom row, we can see that bin max leaves actually outranks um, match SP because bin max leaves favors the winner here, the rebracketed one, the balanced branching for the, this time the input is changed and this is the left branching input for WL. Um, so here we want the rebracketed one to win and we want the isomorphic parts to lose and uh, bin leaves favors the rebracketed one, whereas bin, uh, whereas match favored the losing um, isomorphic one. Right, so that's how to read this support table and you could go through all of these rows and, um, on, and get the information for uh, all of the crucial ranking that's rankings that are in the, um, in the Hasa diagram. Um, and then if you want more detail, there's more information about all of the uh, winner-loser pairs of Optima in this other table. That's what this WL pairs table is. Oop. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the handout. So that's the gist of this. I think this is a good point for me to ask if there's any questions. Uh, before we move on to the next demo. Um, so we just saw how to uh, bring in a violation tableau that was generated in spot um, and then uh, tell OT Workplace to start the project right with this project start and then um, Again, use OT Workplace to do this factorial typology with the fact type calculate command, which generates all these other tabs that have increasing amounts of formatting. This one is very concise with just the optima. Um, and finally, you get the factorial typology. Um, you can filter it to figure out which language is the interesting one, um, and then select it and ask OT Workplace for the ranking information for that. All right, if there's no questions, I'll move on to the next demo. May I ask a question? Uh, oh yeah, please. 
Is there any stage where you can change the definition of one particular constraint or where, or where you can add um, additional uh, constraint in this? Yeah, you could, you could add a, here, let me, uh, let me make a copy of this one. So uh, this is something useful you can, in OT Workplace, if you wanna make a copy of the violation tableau and start a new project, you can do this project start and pick uh, the second option, start a new with a copy. Um, okay, so you can, you can, OT Workplace is just going to look at the numbers in, um, on the VT page to figure out the factorial typology. So if you wanted, you could manually go through and change the, change the numbers in here, or if thing you can do is you could just add another column um, on the side. So for example, if I decided actually I want to have another constraint that says um, I don't like to have um, I don't like to have a maybe maybe I want to penalize I, maybe I want something kind of like strong start. I could put the constraint name here and then you can use I'm going to demonstrate this in the other demos as well. Um, you can use regular expressions and um, and say something like, and, and write out the, the structure that you want to penalize and say, for example, I, I maybe uh, I want to have a penalty when there's um, the first word and then it's followed by a, a five boundary like that. Um, and then I think if I go in the OT workplace menu under gen and eval, I can say evaluate all constraints and it should use this regular expression to fill in the violations for this column. So let's see if this works. Oh, it did work. Okay. So uh, what OT Workplace is doing is it's looking for this uh, string, the parenthesis A and space and then another parenthesis. Um, and it doesn't find it in these guys. So it got zero violations, but then it found one here, uh, right, because we have the, we have that um, subsequence in this this row. So you can add constraints on from the violation tableau page. Um, either you can you can if you can write it with a regular expression or there's also built in constraints which I'll show later um, in OT workplace that you can you can add um, as well. Or you can also like delete columns. Maybe if you say you calculate the, the typology and then you say you know what this is really this typology is too big. I need to make this system simpler. Um, you could just delete a column um, and calculate a new typology from that. Uh, because it just looks at the, once, once you bring it into OT Workplace, OT Workplace just looks at the violation tableau page. Uh, it's not like linking back to spot or anything. So you can do whatever you want on the violation tableau page. And um, I mean, if you do it instantly, then you won't break your system um, and you could just add something. Or if you just kind of randomly scribble things, then you could uh, mess things up as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Any more questions? I'm not sure if I'm seeing uh, if there's anything in the. I guess there's nothing in the chat. Okay. So let's see another way of setting up the system in OT Workplace then. So the second demo is going to be. Uh, instead of using spot to get the violation tableau and set up the system, we'll use a built-in system from OT Workplace. So let me make this big again. Um, okay, so we'll look at the smallest built-in system in OT Workplace, which is called uh, EST, standing for Elementary Syllable Theory. And that might be familiar to you from the original um, Prince and Smolensky 1993. So uh, let's just see the system definition for it first. So the candidate set, uh, the inputs, we want to have um, CVC strings basically, um, but it, it could be, you don't have to have all of, uh, it, it doesn't, it could be just the consonant, just the vowel or uh, VC or CVC. So that's why I put parentheses around all of them. Um, and then for each input, we wanna consider all uh, CV strings that contain at least one vowel, and then they need to be created from uh, whatever the input was by any of the following transformations. So you can delete 
uh, vowels that are not preceded by consonants. So that would be like deleting an onsetless syllable. Uh, you can also delete a consonant that's not followed by a vowel. So that's deleting a coda consonant. Um, we can add a vowel after any consonant that's not already followed by a vowel. So that's a emphasis to repair a coda. And then the last option is um, uh, you can add a consonant before a vowel that's not already, um, sorry, uh, I, there's a typo here, sorry. A uh, consonant can be added before any vowel that's not already preceded by a consonant, sorry. So this would be um, inserting a, emphasizing a consonant to, um, to uh, avoid onset violations. All right, so uh, as an example, with this gen, we wanna say that the, can, the output, possible outputs for input uh, that's just a consonant by itself, or we could either, we could delete this because it doesn't have a vowel, or we could um, insert a vowel nucleus. Or if we have just the vowel by itself as an input, we could either delete that, um, accept it as an onset, onsetless syllable, or we could insert an onset state to fix it. All right, and then for the, so that's the, that's the candidate set that we're gonna have. Um, and then for the constraint set, we'll have two mark in this constraints, um, onset and no coda, and then two faith and list constraints, um, dep and max. All right, so how do we represent this in OT Workplace? So uh, like Spot, OT Workplace can automatically evaluate constraints like we just saw with that uh, strong start example. But unlike in Spot, you can write your own constraints in the, in the program in OT Workplace. So you can do that with the regular expressions. Um, or if you know how to program in VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, then you can do fancier things. Um, and the tricky part is that uh, if you, unless you're a VBA programmer, then you you're stuck using regular expressions to write your constraints. And regular expressions are very restrictive language. Um, and they're only gonna look at the outputs. So that means that if you wanna express any kind of faithfulness constraint, the correspondence information between the input and output, you need to encode somehow in just the output by itself because the regular expressions will not be able to do this kind of comparison of input and output. So typically we need a notation that will encode whether there's a faithfulness violation present in the output. So let's go in OT Workplace and see how um, the authors of OT Workplace handled this for the built-in system. So there's instructions for this in the, in the handout. I'm gonna go back in OT Workplace. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and add this as a, uh, another project in the same OT Workplace um, workbook as before. So to do that, uh, you wanna get your view, the, the last um, tab in your OT Workplace workbook, and then use the little plus button to get a new sheet. I'm gonna magnify it again. Um, and then as usual, go in the OT Workplace menu. And then under build a system, we're gonna select uh, EST. So there's, you can see there's uh, some other ones available here too. All right, so when you click EST, then uh, it fills in these inputs and the outputs um, and also the constraints. And you can see they're pre the markedness constraints are prefixed with an M for markedness. Um, and then the faithfulness constraints are prefixed with an F for faithfulness. So that's, that's uh, just a notational convention to help distinguish the types of constraints. Um, so what are the, um, what is the notation here in OT Workplace? Um, we've got um, the periods for syllable boundaries as usual. Um, so here, this output is just the faithful, keep maintaining the onset list syllable. Um, and then we've got, this output is P with the, with the capital V and the P stands for an uh, epenthesized um, onset. So every time that there's a P, we know that there's a depth violation and that's also represented in the definition of depth up here that says that's looking for P's. 
Um, DEP is also looking for E's, which stand for appendicitized vowels, as in this one here, where the input was just the bare consonant, and then we add the vowel to um, uh, uh, to fix the syllable structure since um, the our candidate set actually requires vowels in every um, either a vowel or a null output, I guess. Um, right, one more notational thing is the how is the representation for deleted segments. So the third, sorry, I'm jumping back to this uh, vowel input. Right, so the vowel input, we could it, we can accept the onset list syllable, we could apenthesize an onset, or the third option is to just delete the vowel um, altogether because it, it violated onset. And that's represented with this capital, capital Y. And so every time we see a capital Y, we know that's gonna be a max violation. And that's encoded here in the definition of um, F dot max. Um, and you can also see the capital X going with the F dot max. And that's um, because the capital X stands for a consonant that was deleted. Okay, so here's the rest of the candidate set. I'm not gonna talk about all the details of it. Um, so this is just the kind of the, the outline of the violation tableau. If we wanna see the actual violations, we can go again in this OT workplace menu under gen and eval, you can pick this evaluate all constraints and that should populate uh, this violation tableau with all the violations that these constraint definitions up here give us. So if I wanted to change this analysis to, um, maybe I wanted to have a separate constraint that is, distinguishes between um, max uh, for vowels versus for consonants, then I could add one over here and say, um, this constraint is just gonna look for uh, deleted vowels, which are represented with a capital Y. And then I could reevaluate and get that too, like so. Or maybe I change my mind and I wanna have this one, um, the other max be only max for consonants. I could change the, the definition up here. Oh, sorry, not Y, um, X. Right, so deleted consonants are represented with the capital X and I could change this one and recalculate um, the, all those violations. Okay, but I'm gonna go back to the one that it was before. And um, delete these. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and calculate the factorial typology for this as well. So again, we can get the factorial typology by going in this OT workplace menu and then picking factorial typology, fact type calculate, and then we'll get this series of dialog boxes. In this case, there's eight languages. Um, and let's not get the, well, actually for, let's do this quickly. So I'm gonna say, uh, I do want the ranking information on all of them. And this might take a little while. It shouldn't be too long because there's eight languages. Um, so you can see OT Workplace is working hard uh, to do all the math for these eight languages. And when it finishes um, calculating them all, then we've got eight tabs down at the bottom, one for each language. And it brings us back to the first language, L1. And I can say, okay. Um, so we can look at the factorial typology and try to get a sense of what all these languages are. Um, we can also look at the, um, the individual language pages and see what the rankings are and look at the supports and so on. Um, if we wanna compare all of the grammars for them at the same time, OT Workplace has a useful tool for that. So if you go in the OT Workplace menu and then under ranking, there's this menu item that says gather MIBS and HASI. So the MIBS is the, again, the minimum, the most informative basis. And then of course the HASI is the, the diagram. And you can do that from any of these pages um, and it will collect for you a page that has, um, it will collect all of the HASI diagrams and the um, MIBS 
onto the same page so you can easily go through and see, oh, let's see, language one has max over dep um, and dep is over onset and no coda. And that's why if we look in the factorial typology, this is a language where um, we don't repair onset list syllables, we don't delete codas, um, and we just appenthesize to uh, repair consonants that don't have um, a nucleus associated with them. Okay, I think. All right, so that's that's the demo that I had, the second demo. So let me ask again um, about questions. Um, I think there's also a third demo in here, but we can we can skip that uh, if there's questions to to discuss. Anybody? I can display this again too. I think Gubazan Sensei has a question. Yeah, can I ask two questions? Um, the first question concerns the the coda um, thing. Um, you didn't make a distinction between coda nasal and coda obstruents, but in some languages you know, coda nasals and coda obstruents behave differently. Uh, how can you make such a dis distinction in the, in your analysis? Yeah, um, great question. So that's, that's actually one of the exercises that we'll do uh, in the practice session. Um, but basically you would need to change the, um, the inputs, right? So I see. The, yeah. So instead of, uh, giving C, just C, you can change it to na N nasal or to obstruent O, the kind of change you can make. Yeah, exactly. So you would want to change the these representations, right? Instead of just having um, C, you would maybe want to have, yeah, N's and O's or I don't know, N's and D's or something, and then you could have separate constraints for them. You change the, you're supposed to change the, the input, right? CV nasal. Oh yeah, yeah. You have to change them both. Here, let's. We can. Um, well, actually, I won't demonstrate it because it's one of the practice mm -hmm. exercises. Okay. Uh, and but. another question is the um, the behavior of on onsetless syllables. In mm -hmm. some languages, onsetless syllables are okay in word initial position, but not in word media position. So, mm. how can you put that kind of positional information? Uh, in your analysis, huh. um, so you're I, talking about monosyllabic words here, right? Yeah, these are all monosyllabic. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, the inputs are monosyllabic. Um, so I think what you could probably what you would want to do. Let me make a copy again. Um, so if you extend the inputs into yeah, exactly, the, you could disyllabic di words, uh, longer words. Yeah, so if you had C, V, uh, v C like this, then you might have, um, I'm not going to try to get all of them, but uh, you could have the faithful one with the hiatus and you could have, or you might, you might have, um, you might have something where you apenthesize a consonant in there. Uh, or whatever, all various possibilities. I think what you would want to do, uh, I guess uh, you would want like a hiatus constraint, right? Let's call it m dot hiatus. Um, and then probably the thing to do would be to have a distinct, um, uh, well, what you could do actually would be to probably have a, have a distinct symbol in the middle of the word like this for when you had a uh, hiatus. And then you could have, I, th I actually don't know if you can use the hash. We'll find out. Um, right, so you could have a separate, sim you kind of need to have some, some form of either a separate symbol or a separate like string of symbols to distinguish um, all the, the structures that you're trying to call out. So let's, I don't, let's see if this one works. I'm not sure, oh, uh, it did work. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, there's various things you can do, and there's there are some built-in um, constraints in OT Workplace as well that can help out with some things. 
um, I put some information about that in the kind of farther down this handout. There's a there's a whole there's actually a so there's a, there's like this quick reference part in here in the OT workplace menu. You can go into quick reference and then you can look at this list of built-in constraint functions there. Um, unfortunately, it's not a complete list. So uh, the third demo in the handout mentions um, an agree constraint, AGR, uh, but that uh, isn't, <laughs> isn't listed on here. So a more complete list you can find on the OT Workplace website. There is this PDF. Um, let's see if I can open it. Yeah, there's this PDF from Alan Prince that lists, um, I think, all, hopefully this is all of the built-in constraint functions. Um, and it has uh, all the details about about them as well. And then it also tells you all kinds of information about um, how you can write your own. Um, I'm normally using OT Workplace with Spot, so I'm normally writing all my constraints in, in, in JavaScript and I haven't tried to write them in VBA, but um, yeah, it's kind of tricky to figure out. You can do a lot in OT Workplace, but this the figuring out how to, how to like the code to the representation to use for your outputs so that you can make the constraints work is probably the the really tricky part uh, in my opinion thank you yeah thanks for that question um any other questions so the other the other i'll just kind of skim a little bit over this third demo that's in the handout so the other this other demo was um uh, based on uh, Lombardi 1999, um, where, you know, I actually, I didn't realize this until just now, but I, I think it's actually a built-in system in here too. So if you go in OT Workplace and you pick, I think if you pick LVT, yeah, um, there's there's this system that can model um, uh, voicing assimilation. So the pattern of, um, mm, Right, we, uh, this this kind of empirically observed typology, where in some languages you neutralize voicing at the end of the syllable, um, in other languages you can have uh, voiced obstruents wherever you want. Other languages there's no vo obstruents anywhere, um, and then you can have uh, assimilation and obstruent clusters with or without uh, word final neutralization of voicing. So this is a built-in system in OT Workplace that's designed to model that. Um, so again, you can get it from this build a system and then you, you pick LVT, it's this one. Um, and then you can evaluate the constraints and see the, the uh, uh, violation profiles. And here again, let's, let's talk a little bit about the representation because I think this is the most difficult thing in OT Workplace. So the trick they've played here um, is the codas are all velar. So the codas are G or K. Um, and then the onsets are all P or B. And then they've used capitalization to represent a uh, change in voicing. So if it was a voice, if it was B in the input and then it becomes P in the output, then they've capitalized the P and that says, oh, this is an ident violation, right? So then the um, here's the a constraint um, faithfulness of uh, voicing for the head consonant. I think this is the, the onset consonant. Um, penalizes the capital B and the capital B, capital, capital P and capital B, but it doesn't complain about the lowercase p. Um, and then the, uh, here's um, two of the built-in functions that this system uses. The, the agree function um, checks for, they could have just listed it, but what this, what this is checking for, if you have um, the, uh, voiceless um, and voiced segments adjacent to each other across the syllable boundary. I mean, consonants adjacent to each other across the syllable boundary. Um, so, um, yeah, I won't go into all the details for that. You can also calculate the the typology for this one, but I think we'll we'll probably don't have time to explain all of it. I think the most useful thing to know about this is that it's it's using these. Um, these built-in functions that you can, built-in constraints that you can use by with this this func keyword, and then you can get the the 
the the whole explanation of all the possible built-in functions is in that um, uh, this guy, this PDF that is on the OT Workplace website. Ooh. Oh, sorry. All right, so let me just kind of summarize and conclude. So I went through um, two at sort of two and a half uh, different ways to set up a system in OT Workplace. So you can use a violation tableau that's from Spot. Um, you can use a built-in system. And the third option that I didn't really go into was writing your own system directly in OT Workplace, but we kind of uh, addressed it a little bit with the, the questions um, from Kubotomo Sensei. So, um, uh, and that, we'll practice this in the, in the, some of the practice sessions as well, uh, how you can try to translate your system into a representation that works in OT Workplace. Um, so once you do have a violation tableau set up, OT Workplace can calculate the factorial typologies um, and constraint rankings. As we saw, it can tell you which candidates are harmonically bounded and which ones um, are, are possible optima, and it can give you the ranking arguments in the those language pages with the supports. Um, there's loads of other features in OT Workplace, like automatically generating metrical parses if you're studying stress systems. There's support for harmonic serialism. You can calculate this thing called the mother of all tableau. You can do a property analysis and other things that I probably have never heard of. Um, so if you're interested in finding out all these other features of OT Workplace, you can explore the menus on, and I would recommend reading uh, works by Alan Prince, Naz Merchant, Birgit Alber, Natalie Del Buso, and other people working um, in Optimality 3 using OT Workplace, um, and you can kind of see the, the kinds of structures that they're referring to and get hints about various other um, arcane features of OT Workplace. All right, so I think we're about out of time, but the, the exercises in the practice period, we'll go through some other systems that are all, uh, they're all kind of modeled on Japanese data, um, so you can practice using OT Workplace. So the I'll be leading one that's uh, again, importing data from spot uh, with accents and tone marking. And then Richard Bibbs will lead one that's uh, modeled on loanword epenthesis. And then Nick Van Handel will do this codicon exercise that's going to distinguish between the um, nasal and obstruent um, codas. So that's, that's the end of the lecture. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much. I believe we learned a lot about uh, OT Workplace and what kind of function it has. Uh, it's uh, some of the functions are maybe straightforward, but other functions might be uh, not that straightforward. And that's why we prepared an exercise session. Uh, so you can uh, do it together uh, with one of the assistant. And also Jenny is uh, uh, gonna lead one of the exercise session. So uh, it's uh, 1059 right now in uh, around 1110 after uh, having a short break, uh, we will uh, create breakout rooms. Actually we'll start creating breakout rooms and then uh, uh, we will assign you to this breakout room so you can uh, actually uh, join the ex exercise session. Yes, enjoy your break and the recording will now stop.